And then Roger Mason hits a three at the buzzer. I take the book, I fire it against the wall, and I think I yelled, Merry f***ing Christmas. <laughs> Lead by Example with Bob Myers is presented for the people by Caesars Sportsbook. You bet you get with Caesars Rewards. Must be 21 or older. Welcome to Lead by Example. I'm your host, Bob Myers. This is the last one. Coach Kerr, thank you for... Uh... Thank you for doing it. I had no choice. I mean, you're my boss. So <laughs> when, my, when my boss says you're coming on a, a podcast, I just I say, yes, sir, boss. And yeah. so here I am. So. Yeah, we're going to do this every other day. <laughs> okay, yeah, we are. It's during the season just to <laughs> map out some of the things I think I see. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so how many years is this in the NBA for you? Well, if you count uh, broadcasting, I did eight years of broadcasting, 15 as a player, and this is nine as a coach, so 32, 32 years. That's good. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> and you're still somewhat sane. Somewhat. Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on the outcome of, of each game. <laughs> what, a, what a life, you know, to, to, to be so uh, dependent on a ball going through the basket. My, my family always talks about it. Like, should we go to dinner after the game? Well, yeah, if you win. <laughs> if you lose, like, we don't want to be with you. So uh, maybe not the healthiest life, but um, but it is fun. What's the over the last all of it? Your maybe college, pro playing GM, uh, this coach. What's been the toughest part of the journey for you? Just the hardest thing you had to navigate. I think the GM job. I'm not just saying yeah. this to butter you up. <laughs> The GM job, which I, I held for three years in Phoenix, was really difficult. Um, number one, I wasn't really prepared for it. I, I jumped in without any experience, and um, I think that was a mistake in hindsight. I needed a little experience before taking on that role. Um, but that really helped prepare me to coach because being in that GM seat allowed me to sort of survey the landscape and understand the relationships involved. And so when I became coach here, when you hired me, I just felt like I was prepared, much more prepared than I was when I became GM in Phoenix. What, what about the GM? I used to watch you on TV. We talked about this. And you looked like you were having a hard time. Yeah. Uh, but, but you've admitted that. Mm -hmm. What about the jobs, besides not being what you would say ready to take it or mm. experienced? Um, I think, number one, I. I knew I wanted to be on the court. I wanted to be with the team, with the players. Um, so having um, my hands off and being upstairs while the team was um, you know, practicing and preparing, I didn't feel like I had um, much of an impact. Um, but I also didn't feel like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. Um, I, I felt like I was supposed to be coaching. And so it wasn't a, an ambition of mine to become a GM. I just I did it because the opportunity came up. Um, the other thing that that I found difficult, and I didn't really um, formulate the idea until I heard you say it, but it it made sense in retrospect for for me and Phoenix was you you told me this years ago as as a GM your possibilities are limitless. Like you literally could make a million moves. You could trade anybody. You could do anything you want. But as a coach, you have your players and you know what decisions you can possibly make. That's a huge difference. Um, and I think that was difficult for me as GM without having much experience trying to figure out what to do to take a good team and get them over the top when there were just so many, so many options but um, no answers. You're, you're kind of guessing on any of it. You, were, you recall the game where you, <laughs> you, I think it was, you're watching on TV and somebody hit a shot and you threw the remote or you did threw something. Through a book. Through a book. Yeah. You remember that pretty vividly. <laughs> <laughs> it was Christmas Day. <laughs> it was Christmas Day. It must have been uh, maybe 2008 and uh, we were playing the Spurs and we needed the game pretty badly. The season had been a struggle. And Roger Mason hit a three at the buzzer to beat us. And someone in my family had given me a book <laughs> that morning. I had opened it up. It's like, oh, thank you. It's a great Meditation. book. Meditation. 
Yeah, probably. Yeah, how to how to stay poised under pressure, you know. And then Roger Mason hits a three at the buzzer. I take the book, I fire it against the wall, and I think I yelled, "Merry f***ing Christmas!" <laughs> <laughs> what a miserable job! Oh, man. What was what, what uh, was I doing? <laughs> you know, I'll tell you because I do that job now. I do find the toughest thing to be watching the team on the road, mm. away from the team, mm -hmm. outside the arena. I think it's easier for me in the arena. I can't do anything in either place, but the helplessness yeah. of, of not being able to do anything, watching it on TV mm -hmm. and feeling powerless is, I can relate to um, that part. And I can relate to wanting to feel like you touch the team. Right. And I think that's what, yeah. when you said you wanted to get down on the mm -hmm. floor, mm -hmm. what you were seeking. For sure, I think um, <clears throat> that's one of the things that is great about the sport. Whether you're a player, coach, or GM, is win or lose, you you it's the human interaction, it's the relationships, and and when you lose, you really want to connect with people. You know, I I text our players a lot after losses, not so much after wins, but after losses, you just I think everybody, or maybe not everybody, but I know I feel this sense of I got to connect with my guys. You know, I'll call a couple of coaches, I'll text a couple of players, and it just makes you feel better to commiserate or to yeah. you know hash things out. And so for sure, when you're disconnected from the team, you you felt it, you have felt it as a GM. I felt it when I was out when I missed uh, games with, after my back issues, and it's a it's a terrible feeling to to you know, feel apart from the team and, and not be connected with the group. Yeah. I think our record without you has been pretty solid. Spotless. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, uh, oh, man. Yeah, Mike Brown's like 16 and zero. <laughs> Luke Walden was yeah, like Luke 51 Walden. and yeah. two or something. Yeah, the year we what broke the record, you were. You know. um, why do you feel like coaching? You told me one time this it took you 50 years to figure out where you were supposed to be in basketball. And you, I think you feel like it was coaching, even though you mm. played and had a great career and general manager of broadcasting. What makes you feel most authentic in this specific role, or, or is that even true? No, it is true. <clears throat> and I think I would have coached um, right out of college if I hadn't made the NBA. And I didn't expect to play in the NBA. So uh, when I was at Arizona playing for Coach Olson, I, I, I remember thinking, hey, I'm going to go into coaching right away. And, and then when it became apparent I might be able to play beyond college, I thought, all right, maybe I'll go to Europe, you know, travel a little bit, play, play in Europe for a few years. And then um, once I made the NBA and was able to stick around and stick around and make a career of it, um, it was like, I mean, this, that's the way to go. You know, play as long as you can. But then I got you know, three, three young kids by the time I retire and coaching. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have started coaching when, I was, when the kids were that young um, if I had a choice, and I had a choice. So that's why I went into broadcasting. Uh, so I was able to, I was really lucky to be able to follow my own path and, and build it around my family's uh, uh, life and, and be able to, to find the, the right balance with broadcasting and playing. But then once the kids were pretty much out of the house, um, it was, for me, it was, it was time to go become a coach because I felt like that's what I was meant to be. What about you, if you seem, you're pretty, I know you well, self-aware, what, what do you have that you think makes you good at it? What, what parts of you make you a good coach in your opinion? Um, <clears throat> I think I understand how to collaborate and... Um, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, not with management. Yeah, no, no. But, you yeah, know, I mean, nobody players, can collaborate yeah. your staff. with those guys. Sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, do, I do think that NBA coaching is a collaboration. It's a collaboration with your stars and with your GM and your owner, and it really has to be this group effort. I remember when I took the job, um, I think Joe said something about – um, you know, you got to be able to manage in every direction. And I had never heard that phrase before. Um, but I do think that's true when you're in a position like this. I think you've got to be able to manage your players, manage your staff, uh, but even manage 
you know, your, your boss or your owner and, and, be, and allow yourself to be managed at the same time. And, and I would say that I think is probably the, the key at this level uh, because um, there's so much pressure and there's it's so much emotion. You have to be able to get through it together. And it's not easy, um, but um, I do think that's a prerequisite. It's, it, people ask me, you've done this job that I do, and um, when I speak about this relationship, I tell people it's built to fail. This relationship right. Right. should fail. Everything is pushing it to fail, yeah. meaning yeah. I'm going to blame you for all the problems. You're going to blame me, and the public, um, the, our own egos, our own insecurities mm -hmm. will shift towards it's your fault, and then you might throw mm -hmm. that back at me. Mm -hmm. Why do you think nine years... Um, and people would think that we've had this great, easy success, and we yeah. have a lot of success, but how come we've been able to maintain that in your mind um, for nine years? Uh, because of Steph Curry? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, th there are other factors, yeah. for sure. I think, I think you and I are, uh, I think there's a reason we're each in our, jobs, I think we're capable of seeing, of being self-aware to say exactly what you just said, how vulnerable we are and how this relationship is built to fail. It just, it just is. But when you have Steph Curry as the centerpiece of your organization, someone who embodies every value that you want to espouse, um, and someone who allows these relationships to flourish day in and day out, win or, win or lose, it just impacts everything. I think Steph has kept this thing afloat because of the power of his own humanity and, and um, who he is uh, on, on top of how great of a player he is. It's, it's the stability that he brings. It reminds me a lot of Tim Duncan in, in San Antonio. When you have that guy, it just makes your job and my job that much easier. He is, um, you've been around superstars played with them, um, played with a huge, you know, two top ten maybe ever players, arguably the best player ever, now Coach Curry. Um, you know, you've talked about Michael in that it was a completely different type of leadership. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I'm saying it the right way, but there's a fear. Mm -hmm. There's a fear to, right. to, to play with him and not let him down. And then Tim and Steph, I don't know if Tim had that. And, I, and, and Steph, I don't think. People aren't afraid of him. They don't want to let him down, but it's a different kind of thing. Steph and Tim are, are a lot alike. I think Tim, Tim was um, very similar in, in the locker room in that everybody loved him. He made everybody feel um, a part of things. Um, he had a great sense of humor, just a really easygoing yet competitive person who loved the game and was completely dedicated to the game. So Tim and Steph... Uh, are remarkably similar. Um, Michael led by fear. There's no yeah. question. I mean, and that was you know well documented in the Last Dance. Everybody could see that, and it obviously worked. You know, we won six championships, or they won six championships during Michael's time there. I was there for three of them. Um, but everybody's different, and that's what makes all this stuff kind of. Um, fun to either be part of or even to watch. It's one of the things that draws me to sports as a sports fan. Yeah. I, I love seeing coach-player dynamics and leadership dynamics within other organizations and watching Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. And, you know, I, I, I love um, seeing these things come to life, these relationships and leadership come to life. It's, it's fun to observe. Yeah. When, when Jordan told, when that huddle that everybody talks about you made that shot. You can't, I know you joke about fear, or maybe really were fearful of him, but in that huddle when he, he looks at you and says, hey, be ready, you weren't, you weren't afraid in that moment, right? You're not afraid to let him down. You were in that moment, and him as a teammate. And how did you um, get to the point where to play with guys like that, you have to be so deferential, right? Uh -huh. And then to think like, well... If he's not open, I'll take the last shot to win the game. Right, I mean, right. How do you even get there mentally? I, I, yeah. I wouldn't have that strength. I, and I, I just, it, people, I don't know that people understand the pressure. Right. Or, or when you're in that moment, how did you navigate that? It took me a long time to get 
to that point. I, I think um, that would have been maybe my 10th year in the league. And <clears throat> I readily admit, like earlier in my career, um, I would not have been ready for that moment. I finally realized that um, you know, I was just overthinking everything as a player and um, early in my career. And so you, you, know, you start thinking about, oh my God, repercussions, what if I miss? And you can't, you can't focus on you know, the, the execution itself. And it took me a long time to not, not just understand that, but to understand what to do about it. Phil Jackson was a huge help. Um, with stuff like that because of his uh, dedication to um, team meditation, um, mindfulness training. We did a lot of that. I did a lot on my own, and I finally got to the point where it was just like, F it. like you just, <laughs> like if you can't just say, F it yeah. and just do it, just, just let yourself go, yeah. regardless of repercussions, then you can't be successful yeah. and, and it, it took me a long time to get there. How do you coach that kind of it mentality? Because we, we I don't where have is it? to. <laughs> was, how do you rein in? Yes, yes. And honestly, it's that it's our, our, with our team, it's the other yeah. way. And, and I mean, I, I, I honestly envy Steph and Clay for their fearlessness. Yeah. Um, they never stop and think about repercussions. But the flip side of that is they get wild, Draymond too, and we've always been a high turnover team. And, and so um, we have to sort of teach the opposite. And the, the trick is not taking away what makes them who they are. You know, you don't want to take away the Mustang yeah. spirit that yeah. these guys have. But can we execute a little bit better? We always talk about finding the balance between, you know, being loose and disciplined. You know, what, what does that mean? It means you got to be able to execute the play or the defensive scheme and let that 30-footer go without worrying about repercussions. And, th and those guys have obviously found a way. I mean, they've, they've won multiple championships. So, what, um, the, Your the principles, I know them, but what are they and how would you come up with them? So uh, before I started coaching, I visited with a, a few other coaches, and one of whom was Pete Carroll and, and – uh, Went and saw him in, during training camp in Seattle, and he was uh, he was great. He pulled me aside. You know, I was sitting in on all their coaches' meetings, um, watching practices, and he pulls me aside on the second day I'm there, and he goes, uh, "So how are you going to coach your team?" I said, "You mean like what offense am I going to run?" He goes, "No, that stuff doesn't even matter." And I'm like, "How are you going?" He goes, "How are you going to coach your team?" I go, well, "What does that even mean?" He goes, what are the players going to feel when they walk into the building every day? What's the vibe? What's the culture? We're like, how are you going to um, just determine like what they feel when they walk into the building every day? And it that started this conversation where he basically laid it out, and it was an incredible story. But he said he had coached in the NFL for four years, a couple of years with New England, a couple of years with the Jets, gets fired, comes here to San Francisco as a uh, coach with the Niners, and he said at the end of every day, he'd go and sit with Bill Walsh. Mm. And he said Bill Walsh taught him about culture. And he said that, that, that Bill Walsh told him, you've got to figure out who you are. What are the values that make you who you are? And those values are, have to become the culture, but you've got to figure out how to make those values come alive. They can't just be words mm. on a wall. So P was explaining all this, and... Uh, it made so much sense because I had felt that in San Antonio with Pop and Chicago with, with Phil. But nobody had ever sort of expressed it that way. So for the next couple of days, we talked about, you know, what, what those values would be for me, what, like lo really looking into my own uh, past and who I am, and then how to make those values come alive. And uh, fascinating, but Pete said he really learned that from Bill Walsh. So yeah, pretty cool. So yours values yeah. are competitiveness, right. mindfulness, compassion, and joy. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so we have a few team rules, yeah. you know. But we but, do. Yeah, <laughs> they're never enforced. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, protect the team right. is a is a is a uh, is a, a team rule, but. Uh, but everything is sort of um, encompassed with the values. And, and so what Pete taught me was if, if joy is 
one of your values, then there better be joy at practice. Mm -hmm. There better be joy in the building every day. So hiring people who have a sense of humor and who can laugh at themselves to, on your staff is really important. And then hiring creative people who can, you know, make practice fun and and lively and playing music and and you know celebrating players' families and their you know accomplishments, you know, birth of a child. Like we want the players to walk into this building every day feeling the joy that comes from being in a place you want to be. Yeah, yeah. And what's the toughest? of those for, to, to kind of get an NBA team to buy into? I think the mindfulness, and, and um, it's uh, because it's, it's not a common thing to practice, and it's also something that, um, that I don't teach myself. That, so we have someone who comes in and works with the players. And, and, uh, but it was interesting when, when I first felt that in Chicago, we had a, a meditation se session. Every guy who was new, as soon as we started, you know, we're all like opening our <laughs> eyes like, is the joke on me? Like, you know, nobody really th thought it was serious. And then you realize it's, you know, this is actually something you can, you can do. You can train your mind and body and, and learn how to breathe and learn how to deal with pressure. And, yeah. um, but, but it's the trickiest because it's, um, it's, it's not that tangible, yeah. you know, you have to sort of feel it and it takes time. What would your dad say if he was here about this, your journey? He, uh, he wouldn't believe it, you know. It, 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 my journey really is incredibly unlikely. Um, right. I guess you could say that about a lot of people's journey. There's, there does seem to be so much um, randomness in, in all of this, you know, for, for everybody. But considering I, I was, you know, barely recruited out of high school, uh, I never expected to be in the NBA and then to, you know, play with Michael Jordan. I mean, it's so unlikely, yeah. you know. Um, so I think he would be, uh, he would be shocked. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he would have enjoyed Thoroughly enjoyed watching, and and that's it's um, something I think about a lot. You know, my dad never got to see me play, even in college, and I think about him a lot because I know he he would have enjoyed this so much. And uh, sometimes during the national anthem, I mm. I just I think of my dad. What um if you could pick a moment for him to see, which one would you pick? Um, the easy answer is, you know, hitting the shot in 97 to, um, to win. But I, I think maybe the more powerful one would have been the, the, uh, our championship mm -hmm. in 15 because my dad was a teacher mm. and my, I come from a family of educators. And so I'm actually kind of in the family business as a coach. You know, yeah. I'm just teaching something else. You yeah. know, I'm not teaching political science like he did, but, but I'm teaching basketball. And, and um, I think he would have taken great joy in seeing our team win and seeing me as a, as a coach, yeah. as a leader of, of, uh, of men who um, did something really special. I think that would have been um, pretty special for him to see. Feels like you were reared in a pretty balanced environment. It wasn't wasn't super sports centric, even though you were supported. Does that help you now? Because we joked at the start about the attention that you get coaching a team that tries to put this leather thing in an iron circle, and that that can take on this whole life. Mm -hmm. Has that helped you put it in the right place, or how do you figure out what it means to have nine rings or four with the Warriors or? walk around town and people treat you a certain way. Where, where do you put all that in your mind? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I am, I am a, um, definitely a product of my upbringing and my, my, my family. And um, so one thing that we were always taught was perspective. You know, we traveled a lot, um, lived overseas for several years growing up. and saw people in, you know, really deep poverty um, in places like like Egypt and Tunisia and 
Lebanon, and and um, it's what an incredible education as a young kid to see other cultures, to be in other cultures. So I think it gives you a perspective and and allows you to have um, empathy for people and and allows you to be incredibly thankful for what you have. And so that's how I've always felt, you know, just the first day I stepped on a on a basketball court in college all the way till now. It's like, I get to do this, yeah. you know? So yeah. I think my family um, instilled that, that um, gratitude in all, all, all four of us kids. I remember, I don't know, it was a few years ago, I, I was tired. <laughs> I think we were like five years in a row in the finals. And I said, what are we doing? I said, the price you pay, mm. right, to do these things yeah. that, are, that are everybody wants, not everybody, but many people want to do, want to coach the Warriors or general manage yeah. the Warriors. And I, I remember asking you, what, what, what's the, um, where's the gratification? Yeah. Do you remember what you said? Do you remember what you said, this is the best part of what we do? I think just, I probably said the, uh, the relationships and, and just um, seeing everyone each day. Like, I, I, that's, I mean, this, that's how I would answer it right now yeah. is coming into the building and seeing a bunch of people I really like and getting to work with them every single day. That's, uh, yeah. what was my answer then? You said, not that, that's a good answer <laughs> too. And I remember it because I've thought about it. You said, the joy we give to the community mm. Is, yeah. is the, the joy you give to the guy, truck driver, mm -hmm. or the nurse, mm -hmm. or the people that say, I was recovering from an injury and I was watching yeah. the games. That's what your answer, you yeah. said what we give back, what, how much people care, the joy you give, what, what profession can you choose where you right. are able to provide that much joy? Yeah. And I thought that was really, um, really selfless. And it's always the things that we do for other people that feel the best. Right. You right. Know, so I thought that was a really uh, well. There's such power in um, the emotion of what we do, and so many people are so interested in uh, in you know watching our, us play. And um, this has been such a special era. It's not just a successful team, but it's a team that's really fun to watch. Um, th there's a beauty to the the flow and the the style, but then there's a connection to the the people. And the, the continuity that we've had on the roster with Steph and Clay and Draymond and Andre, the people in the Bay and all, all over the world have connected with those guys. And I, when people ask me what's my favorite thing about Steph, it's that he understands his power. Mm -hmm. you know, he understands how happy he can make people every single day. It, it, you know, whether there's a camera around or not, it makes no difference. He understands that just taking a moment and saying hi to someone um, can make someone so happy, and yeah. so he. I think he 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 likes that. He he because he's he's just a really good-hearted human being, and but he recognizes it, and so even when he's not feeling great, he st will still go out of his way to to like make someone's day. Yeah, that's his skill because mm -hmm. not everybody, not everybody can do that. No, or has that even if they should. Um, that's right. Two thousand fifteen. We were down 2-1 to Cleveland, and you, well chronicled story where you made Nick Uren famous. <laughs> uh, he's, you went up there after we won, I think game four. We are down 2-1, game four, mm -hmm. and you adjusted the lineup, we mm -hmm. went small. And I tell this story to people that you credited, an example of leadership, you credited Nick Uren. Uh, a lot of coaches I think wouldn't have done that. Um, I tell the story that had it not worked, Nobody, nobody would have heard the name Nick Uren. Right, right. Would you? What would you have done had it now? Would you have? Just oh, said, I would have blamed yeah. Nick for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, <laughs> the bus. What was he thinking? Yeah. What was that guy uh, thinking? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Was it easy? Did you just know this doesn't work? Obviously, it worked. Was would it have been so easy to say? Yeah, I thought I thought going small. Is that is that simple for you? Or yeah. or would it have? Yeah. Because human nature is not to do that. It would have been somebody on my staff said to go small. Pretty simple to make I, that there's a, there, You know, there's a, <clears throat> there's a lot of moments like that as a, uh, as a coach where you just, you know, you, 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 have, to, you have to take it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the job. Yeah. You know, that really is the job is, is if, if, if something goes wrong, mm -hmm. um, whether it's your fault or not, it's, you're the coach of the team, so you just you just take it and 
And then if, if someone does something that's, that's really effective and you give them credit, it's, it's, it's a powerful gesture. And it's a reminder to the whole group that like, we all matter. Every, you know, Nick was our video coordinator yeah. at the time, and he has the great idea. Great. Yeah. It doesn't matter who has the idea. Let's just find the best yeah. path. But for sure, as a, as a coach or the best player, you, you, know, you just take... Uh, take responsibility, good or bad, and in the end, that's um, that's kind of the job. And it's even though it, it maybe it's uh, like you said, it goes against human nature. I think once you realize the power of accepting responsibility, then you realize even when you're wrong, like people will respect you for that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, like it, you. you it's okay to be wrong. We all make mistakes, but just just take the responsibility, yeah. and and people will appreciate that. Yeah. So, nine years here as the coach, anything you look back on and say, I would have, wish I would have done this differently, or this moment, if I could go back. You know, I mean, this one is um, after after my first year. Um, that was when I hurt my back, mm -hmm. and it was I didn't take care of myself, and so I, it's one of the great r regrets of my life. Is um, you know I'm on top of the world. We win the championship. My back's kind of sore. I'm like, ah, I'm fine, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like you you win the title. Sometimes sometimes we, we, you have great success. Um, I don't want to say it goes to your head, it, I mean, it, but it, 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 it makes you feel invincible. Mm. And I actually think that winning the championship that year kind of made me feel invincible. Mm -hmm. And I needed to take a few weeks and, you know, rest and recover and have, you know, help, have somebody give, you know, help me with rehab. And, and I just said, no, I'm going to plow through this. I'm going to go play golf. I'm going to dine to do this, yeah. do that. And I, you know, I ended up, really you know suffering you know major major health issue mm -hmm. that um i will always regret because i felt like i could have handled mm -hmm. you know and, and it's so ironic because i'm a coach and i would yeah. never yeah. ever tell one of our players you know i'd be like no you got to take care of yourself yeah. i didn't take care of myself yeah. and it's like as a coach i'm i should know better i, sh I needed to coach myself and yeah. uh so it's been, you know, it's been an incredible ride and an amazing nine-year run. And I, so I wouldn't really take anything back from a basketball standpoint, but I would have taken better care of myself. You watch other coaches. Mm -hmm. You know other coaches in other sports. I watch them. I've only ever been to the, with the Warriors. And you see what being a head coach, the cost of it. Yeah. Health. Mm -hmm. you, you just referenced it. Yeah acute thing for you, but not, I mean, I, I know it sounds like you're beating yourself up, but I can relate to this feeling of, I can handle anything. Mm -hmm. You just reach this place, yeah. this mountaintop. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's not super healthy in a way, right? Because you forget not, yeah. and you're tired and you're just euphoric and there's all kinds of things going on. When you see maybe an NFL coach or coaches that lost the NCAA tournament or these difficult moments or great moments. What do you see as a coach? What is relatable for you? And also, when you see the wear and tear, how do you process yeah. those things? I really like seeing the the, um, the coaches who are able to handle either one really well. You know, um, Jay Wright was a good friend of mine. We were on the uh, Team USA staff together under under Pop. And I'll never forget when his team won the national championship at the buzzer. Remember, um, I think his name was Chris Jenkins, mm -hmm. made a three. Yeah. Well, you know, Jay had this great out of bounds play, uh, full court out of bounds play, and and uh, so the guy brings it up, Archie Diacono brings it up, flips it back to Jenkins. He makes a three, and they show Jay on the sidelines. And I think most coaches would have like gone crit right, and he he watches, shot goes up, and you can just see his lips. He just says. Boom. And then he walks down, no emotion. And I asked him about it afterwards. I said, how, did, how were you not emotional? He said, because my first thought was, Roy Williams is devastated right now because that shot, that shot 
could have just missed, but instead it went in. And just because one shot went in, I get to win and he's got to suffer. And, he, and I know exactly how he feels. And I was like, that's one of the coolest answers I've ever heard. But I, I love it. Pop, you know, Pop was the ultimate, um, like, in, 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 in losing a game, he was always so gracious and so uh, happy for the, the opposing team and the opposing coach. And it was genuine. Yeah. And so I, I really feel that way. We are kind of a fraternity in the coaching world. And despite this incredible competitive environment we're in, having the humanity to understand other people are allowed to be happy too. Mm -hmm. And other people are suffering too. And just behaving in a way that brings respect to, to the organization, I think is a must. And I, so I love watching coaches who handle that stuff well. You, I think, are still off Twitter. Are you back on? Off. off. So you, I remember yeah. when you started, mm -hmm. you, were, you were on Twitter. Yeah, it was on not, before not, not, I Oh, became, you were on before. Okay, sorry. Before I was But, but you were coaching while on Twitter mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. and I remember thinking to myself, this is not a good idea. Yeah. But I didn't say yeah. that to you because you didn't outwardly show any issue with it. Yeah. But then one day, I don't know when, you could tell the story, you said, I'm, that's it. Yeah. Well, I... Um, you know, when I got on, I was using it as a news feed, sure. you know, following the, the writers that I wanted to, to, to follow and seemed pretty innocuous, you know. And, and then as it, as it went, you know, you start to see more, you know, feedback or people, you know, criticism, judgment, whatever. And it's like, well, that's not healthy. I don't need to see that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so James Wiseman, his, I think it was his rookie year, um, was going through a rough time, and uh, and I knew he was getting beaten up, in, you know, in social media wise. And I pulled him aside and I said, are, "How are you doing with the social media stuff?" He goes, "Yeah, it's tough." I, I said, "You know, it's tough for me too. Like, it's not healthy for any of us to see this kind of criticism." I said, "What do you say we just yeah. quit together? Yeah. Give it a couple months?" And he's like, "Yeah, great idea." Yeah. And that was two and a half years ago. Yeah. So I I haven't I'm not back and I don't think I ever will be um, yeah. and uh, James stayed with it for a long time I don't know if he you know went back the next year but there's no doubt that's it's a huge uh, factor in today's sports world um, for our players coaches and you know it's like I don't know ignorance is bliss so well, when you were not. playing I asked you when you were with I think the Bulls or Somewhere you told me where it used to be as a player where if you didn't want to hear about yourself, you just didn't read the Chicago right. Sun-Times right. or, or maybe turn on the radio. Although I don't think sports talk radio was the same, maybe in New York, but not the same as it is yeah. now. So you could pretty easily escape anybody, any, right. any praise, any criticism. Yeah. And you talked about that. And then now coaching a team where most of the team, if not all, is looking at their phones at mm -hmm. halftime. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody on our team that's not on Twitter or mm -hmm. Instagram or whatever they're on. How, how do you see that affecting players now as opposed to what, what you were dealing with when you played? I just think it's so much more accessible now. And um, back then, you, you know, like you said, it was a newspaper maybe talk radio, but very easy to avoid if you wanted. But I remember players, you know, being upset with uh, beat writers and maybe having an argument, but it wasn't this constant barrage of judgment, criticism in your fingertips from everybody, you know. Back then it was just a beat writer. You know, now it's, uh, you know, Bob from, you know, Fremont yeah. or, you know, whoever. Like, it just doesn't matter. Um, Everybody's got access to these guys. So I think it's never been harder to be a professional athlete or someone in the limelight and to navigate it. And um, it's, it's something that I have a lot of empathy for our players and, and for young people in general having to deal with this dynamic. It's yeah. not easy. I remember when you were trying to figure out where to coach and I called you after we lost and had let go of Mark and we're interviewing people, and I said, hey, 
I'd like to talk to you, and you said, I'm, there's no, you didn't say it this way, but kind of like there's no point. I'm down the line. Um, and I talked, I said, okay. I said, you said I'm aligned with Phil and this and that. It's okay. Um, and Steph had just said he didn't want us to let go of Mark. You know, he said that publicly. So I think there's a little fear there. And you, I remember asking you, can we at least talk to you? And you said, well, it's kind of down, I'm kind of for along here. And then you came, you know, didn't, didn't work out for some reasons, and then you, you interviewed with us. Do you ever think back on <laughs> what um, a life, you know, that you get that job? Yeah. yeah. You know, because I think about when I took the Warriors job, I didn't, I didn't have any options. Nobody, Joe and Peter hired me, but, but that was the first job I was ever offered right. as, as an agent, which I wanted to change out of. So I can't look back and say, what if I had taken that job or that job? Nobody gave me one. But for you, you kind of had this point, you know, this point in life. Yeah. It's a pretty big inflection. Yeah. Point. Yeah. I w I honestly, I would have been fired within two years because that's that was the pattern. Um, and everything it, it, it was about uh, the talent. I mean, the, the reason I ended up here is because several people who are very close to me called me up and just said, you have to go where the talent is. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and, and one, one good friend of mine said, I know you love Phil, and you should for everything he did for you, but what would he do? Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, yeah, he'd go coach Steph Curry and Draymond <laughs> Green and Clay Thompson, right? Yeah. Because as yeah. a coach, I mean, yeah. it's all about yeah. it's all about the talent. And, um, and the Warriors were on the rise and the Knicks were, were kind of, um, you know, they were an average team, um, not a ton of talent. So I just, I don't know, I, it, it would not have worked out for very long and, and who knows what would have happened, yeah. but um, I, yeah, made a good choice. You, um, it's, we, we, the year, I think the year before you came, we hired a guy, I represented Brian Scalabrini and he was debating whether he wanted to coach or not unsure and he said okay and he decided to come that was on Mark's staff and I said why doesn't seem like you are that in or you're not sure or why do you want to do it he said I'm only coming because this team can win a championship hmm. and we had just lost in the second round of the Spurs mm -hmm. and I remember thinking what are you talking about yeah. you know and we had just I guess Iguodala was on the team I guess we just got Iguodala because we had we had um, beaten Denver, then lost to the Spurs, and Andre came. And um, for you, I remember when we hired you, you said, you, you said this roster has what, what it needs. And then you said, but I think I need to bring Andre off the bench. And you said, I said, well, <laughs> how are you going to do that? <laughs> and you said, I'm going to go see him. I'm going to go talk to him. I'm going to go see Andre. And I don't. I don't think I went with you. I think you and I went to talk to Harrison mm -hmm. Barnes. In Miami. Yeah, Miami. Yeah. You and I went there, but I don't think I went with you. You flew to Australia to see Bogut, mm -hmm. and then you went to see Andre, but I think that was just you. It was here. It was, it was just here. here, yeah. And you, do you remember what, how that went? Yeah, yeah. But that was a, that was a series of conversations. Yeah, right. it, took, it, wasn't, it took a while. But you had to have broached it at some point. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And how did you broach it? And what did um, <clears throat> Well, it, it helped that we were both Arizona guys. We shared the Lute Olson connection, and uh, we shared a similar vision for how the game should be played. Um, but I think um, I just referenced Manu Ginobili, and I said, this is how I s mm -hmm. see this team. I said, I, I think Harrison needs the starters in order to, f to really flourish. He needs to play with Steph and, and Clay. And our bench needs you in, in order to flourish. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know you've never come off the bench in your life. I think he had literally started 1,100 straight games yeah. to, in his career, never once come off the bench. And um, he was willing to try it. But he wasn't thrilled about it, but he respected the ask and, um, and understood the vision. 
because I had I was really influenced by San Antonio and pop and everything that I had experienced there and, and observed after I left there. Ginobili's you know Hall of Famer and he came off the bench for six or seven years and they were winning titles and Andre was. He told me later on, he goes, it's, it was good that it happened at that stage of my career. If this had been after my fifth year, I would have said no way. Yeah. But it was after my 10th or 11th year, and it's like, okay, yeah. I can do this. It's such a, him sacrificing, you know, because everybody wants to start, and mm -hmm. I know he saw the vision. But to get the finals MVP, that's one of my favorite stories, that then all of a sudden in the finals you tapped him and said, okay, now, now I need you to yeah. start. Yeah. <laughs> what a great... I find it hard to believe that many people would accept, even if they mm -hmm. saw the vision, because it's not like you had never coached before. Right. It wasn't like you were Phil Jackson or Greg Popovich saying, right. hey, Manu, mm -hmm. he'd won championships. Right. You had not coached. Yeah. Well, you coached that, that rec league team? Yeah, my son's eighth grade <laughs> uh, yeah, club team. <laughs> Did you win a championship? Uh, third, third place. Uh, I mean. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Caesars Sportsbook is not just an app, it's a whole empire. Iconic casinos, hotels, world-class restaurants, it's all yours with Caesars Rewards. Because every bet you place, win or lose, earns reward credits, which you can redeem for hotel stays at over 50 destinations, meals, tickets, merch, bonuses, and more. Get started today. Create an account with promo code OMAHAFULL. What was it like, um, we talked a lot about step, what was it like coaching Durant? I loved coaching Kevin. Um, you know, when he arrived, he was so ready to, to experience a different style of basketball. And I think that was one of the reasons he, he came here. Um, he, he was obviously MVP, um, already one of the greatest players ever. But he wanted to experience the motion um, that, that we, that we ha had always played with. And so that first year, he was a sponge. I mean, he was constantly asking me questions, and and we're <clears throat> you know going through different um, dynamics of the offense and little things to look for when you're playing with Steph and Clay. And, um, and I think he really enjoyed it. I think he loved it. And then I think by the end of the second year, that's when it just became um, a little bit more of um, just I guess a a, a labor. You know, than than a than a joy um, for him, and um, so it, it it got difficult the third year. It was it was more difficult to communicate uh, with him because he wasn't he wasn't happy. Um, but I always appreciated his heart and his humanity. He's a very vulnerable person, and and especially the first two years, he he really gave of himself to the team. And was you know Finals MVP both years, so he was uh, he was great to coach. It just it was just one of those things where it it just wasn't going to be a long term thing. I remember he'd always work out on that one <clears throat> basket yeah. in Oakland, and just watching him go through his routine. I'll never I mean this this mesmerizing mesmerizing oh. that's the right word. Yeah, and he did it all all Every the day. time. Yeah, and I think. Um, to, you've been around a lot of great players, and I suppose the, the common thread is they all, maybe the fans and people don't understand how much they love the game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be beyond understanding. Right. And I think he yeah. has this, I think the thing he loves the most is basketball. Yeah, I think he loses himself yeah. in the game, and uh, a lot like Steph, you know. Yeah. They, would, they would each be at one end of the floor, uh, you know, post-practice, going through those mm -hmm. workouts. And every once in a while, they would join. And, and that was fun, too, yeah. when they would do their oh, workout yeah. together. But it was when they would each take one side of the floor post-practice and do their 30- or 40-minute shooting workouts. i just sit in the middle and watch. You charge money. Oh, it was just... I don't think people understand. Like, watching, you're right, here, one there and one there. Two of the best ever to yeah. play. Yeah, no, you're you're you know you're watching Mozart yeah. Yeah. the piano. No, know? like really, you are. I mean, it's. Yeah. I know it sounds like hyperbole, but it. Yeah. You are talking about. Yeah. I think that, you know, the two. Yeah. Two greatest at what they've what they do, yeah. just and how they go about it. It's just yeah. amazing to watch. 
So we, you, it's funny, you told me a few years ago to watch the Eagles documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> you got to watch the Eagles documentary. And I thought, okay, I like the Eagles. Yeah. And, I, and, you go, you, and then you, you circled back and said, have you watched it? I said, ah, it's long, it's long. Yeah. And you go, you got to do it. And I remember watching it still to this day. It's probably the best documentary I've ever seen. I don't know that I would even think of a, a second place. Mm. Maybe because of the things that I saw in it about a band that was amazing. I mean, when you're watching them at the opening scene and then you, you hear all the songs they, mm -hmm. the Eagles did that too, they did yeah. that too. And even when Don Henley and Gwen Fry broke off, even the songs mm -hmm. they did. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I joke about, <laughs> there was the scene where the bandmate pours the beer, you can, you can tell it, and, and the why of it, and what the relevancy of it. Yeah, I think uh, the, the lead guitarist, um, Felder, I think yeah, his last yeah, name yeah, was, yeah. was just, he had just had enough, and he, he and uh, Henley were just like this. And remember, that I think there's a scene in the documentary where they're playing a song and arguing yeah, at yeah. the same time on stage, on stage yeah, yeah. at a concert. I mean, and so, yeah, the, uh, that's, the, that's the metaphor. That's the question, right, is for, for us, is like yeah. how long can the band stay together and, uh, and continue to, you know, to, uh, to make great music and to thrive. And, and um, in sports, probably just like in music, um, yeah. these things seem to have a, uh, a shelf life, you know, so it's it's tricky. I've always tell people uh, in my, through my lens, is that the best thing, the most proud I am in my capacity is that we've kept it together mm -hmm. and how hard that is and, and how misunderstood that is, the yeah. difficulty of that. How many times you're in my relationship could have fractured. Mm -hmm. You and Steph, me and Draymond, you and Draymond, Anybody, Clay, Andre. We traded Andre um, and how graceful he took that. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. I, he, he was doing his exit interview. and I, More gracefully than I did, by the way. Yeah, I, you were I not. Was yeah. not <laughs> yeah. I was not You asked happy. me what I'm upset about. <laughs> <laughs> you were not pleased about no, that. But no. there was a vision. No. <laughs> I remember sitting across from him in the exit interview in Oakland, and we just lost 2019. To Toronto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said... He had another year, and he said something like, because um, he's pretty, you know, Andre. He knows. He's smart. He goes, what's happened with me? And I said, we might trade you. And he didn't, he, he accepted that. Not that, that, that's not easy, but I looked at him, I said, you know, we might trade you. I don't know, Andre, but mm -hmm. we might. It depends. Mm -hmm. And he goes, okay. And it wasn't like a you okay? It was like, okay, I understand. Hmm. And I remember thinking, what a decent yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm sitting here telling him, this guy won finals MVP yeah, for us. Yeah, Had played in five finals, yeah. come off the bench. Right. And, and Mitt probably took a step, a back seat to his talent mm -hmm. to support other talent. Mm -hmm. And then for him to come, want to come back, you know? Mm -hmm. That was, yeah. he could have easily, you know, people yeah. hold grudges in this business. Sure. And for him to come back and for you and I to stay connected and to, to have the worst record in the NBA, mm -hmm. to go through, we weren't in the bubble, um, to win it again last year. I just, that's the pride of keeping it together because in the Eagles example, guys want to do the solo career. Right, right. And, yeah. and, and I think that the energy that goes into that as a coach and, and what mm -hmm. I do is what is what is hard to explain to people. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's also where Steph really comes into play right. in terms of, you know, keeping keeping the group together. Um, Andre, I don't think if Steph's not here, Andre doesn't want to come back. You know, Steph is 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 so uh, appealing and attractive to to all of his teammates because of who he is and not, not just how he plays and how good he is, but just who he is as a human being. <clears throat> and so you, you, you factor in Steph and it's like, all right, now we can actually, you and I can do our jobs, right? Yeah. We, you can make whatever 
uh, moves you need to make to keep the roster fortified. I can, you know, coach however I need to coach. But more importantly, you and I can manage the group and, and maintain these relationships to where we can maintain our values and, and our culture so that you can tell Andre Iguodala, hey, you know, we might trade you and actually have a really decent response. Like, this stuff has, has stayed together because of these relationships uh, yeah. being so positive. But I, I always go back to Steph yeah. when, as the reason all these relationships can flourish. He's the, uh, he's the Glenn Fry that is, that, you know, supports everybody else. Yeah. He, he's the nicest, um, selfless, does it totally for the joy of it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You're right, that's the fabric, that's the epicenter. Right. right. And, and that's yeah. the, and it's easy to revolve around that because of who he is. Mm -hmm. Uh, last one, so you have a, a son that, uh, you have a fam, you know, your kids are going different directions. One's in coaching, um, and they have watched you uh, throughout your life, right? They've watched you play, mm -hmm. coach, broadcast. When they all are older, and they're, they're not young now, and you, your family's even growing, what do you hope, if you ask any one of them or all of them, what was your dad like? And, and picture them being asked 20 years from mm. now. I, I don't think you'll still be coaching. Maybe. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah. I better yeah, not. Right. Um, what, what do you hope you get from uh, one of them or all yeah. of them? Or? Um, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, it's a good question. It's a hard question to answer um, because, um, you know, you just, you, 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 you just want to be, um, remembered as the dad who, uh, as a dad who really loved his kids, and and um, you know that's we have such a, a, a close family that um, we we share we share a lot of love together, and so I, I you know I I don't think about. The way you ask the question, I don't think about you know my legacy as a dad. Mm -hmm. I just think about how lucky I am to be their dad, you know, mm. and to to have their love and to have the, the love in our family the way we do. Um, that's that's what is most important to me, and that will always be the most important thing to me. Well said. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. That was yeah. fun. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Thanks for uh, coming on. Yeah, appreciate it. What do I have to do Nothing. now? So you're I've good. Got, I think you got to go get a win. You are my tomorrow. boss. So you got to win the win, game. Win, yeah, yeah, win the rest of the games, oh, okay. and then uh, win the rest of those <laughs> games. <laughs> All right, appreciate Thank it. Thank you.